When, whenever you'd like to start, go ahead and start. Since the five perfections without wisdom cannot bring perfect enlightenment, along with skillful means, cultivate the wisdom which does not conceive the three spheres, this is the practice of bodhisattvas. Without wisdom, the other five perfections alone are not enough to reach complete enlightenment. Thus, combined with skillful means, develop the wisdom that does not distinguish among the three spheres. This is the way of a bodhisattva. Behader chokhma lo nitan lehasig yara mushlemet באמצעות חמש השלמויות האחרות בלבד. לפיכך, בד בבד עם שיטה מיומנת, לטפח חוכמה שאינה מבדילה בין שלושת המעגלים, זוהי דרך הבודיסטווה. Uh, I found a small book uh, in which it was written, As you have been my parents, I love you. To those who love me, I wish to, I wish to give something that is like my own heart, the two-fold bodhicitta, which is also the heart of the Buddhas of the three spheres. As this book explains the two types of bodhicitta, please read it every day. I read it in Hebrew. ביותכם הוריי משכבר, אני אוהב אתכם. לכל האהובים אותי, ארצה לתת דבר מה השקול לליבי. הבודיצ'יטה הכפולה. שהינה גם ליבם של כל הבודות בשלושת הזמנים. מאחר וספרון זה מסביר את שני הבודיצ'יטה, בבקשה קראו בו מדי יום. So um, there, are, there are so many really beautiful commentaries of this practice. So I hope that um, you're inspired to seek them out and have a look. And um, they, uh, sometimes they're very similar in how they interpret the verse and sometimes they're very different. And that's an interesting point of exploration. So um, anyway, uh, we're up to verse 32. So if you wanna just uh, make sure you're on page five of your main text, we're looking at verse 32. If through the influence of disturbing emotions, you point out the faults of another bodhisattva, you yourself are diminished. So don't mention the faults of those who have entered the great vehicle. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. So this verse seems very straightforward, but there's actually a lot of layers and a lot of um, references to, you know, course to subtle practices within this verse. So the surface level of the verse is don't criticize bodhisattvas. But as soon as you sit with that, you think, well, who's a bodhisattva? <laughs> Do I know who's a bodhisattva? We have no idea who's a bodhisattva or not. Um, you, there's a famous quote from the Buddha where he says, you cannot take another person's measure, for to do so would lead to ruin. Yeah, you cannot take another person's measure. And in particular, you know, we know we have our projections and our transference from the psychological perspective. And then from the Buddhist perspective, we have karmic obscure and karmic predispositions, which means that sometimes the very, quote, best of people or the most um, enlightened of people appear to us as not that because we don't actually have the karma to see them fully or clearly. So we have no idea who anyone is. 
The sweetest, kindest person in our life might be a completely ordinary being, and the one who is the most hard work, who is the most disruptive, who is maybe even destructive, could be the bodhisattva. We had no way of knowing for sure. So then what does this mean if you see harm, you know, and merely labeled harm, but harm? If you see harm, how can you not criticize or pick at the faults or et cetera, et cetera? What's the point being said here that's not spiritual bypassing or is not disassociation or is not minimizing harm? And it's talking about this training on the sutra level of, you know, looking for the positive in order to increase your own virtue, the practice of rejoicing. It's also the tantric practice of training in pure view. So there's kind of two levels of this verse. And the basic idea is as soon as your mind is in the mood to pick out faults, you start to see faults everywhere. Do you know how your mind gets, right? So if one thing has annoyed you about one dynamic, then suddenly everything else is also wrong. And you start picking at all of the little things in life because your mind has shifted into a critical mindset. And some people spend their whole life there. But, you know, all of us, even sort of, you know, friendly, looking towards the positive people um, can get into this where one difficult thing happens and then it's like a domino effect and we start to see the negative in everything. And then, then life starts to feel really heavy. And so the training here is not to pretend that difficulty doesn't exist. It's not to pretend that you don't see what you think to be false. It's that we're training to first start in not mentioning them. Yeah. So if you, you know, there's, um, there's another famous Dharma quote um, about basically when you're by yourself, watch your mind. When you're with other people, watch your speech. And there's something really interesting about that because if you're watching your speech, in a way you are watching your mind as well. But when we're with other people, it's, it's so easy to fall into the trap of talking what you always talk about. And maybe what you always talk about is how people are crap, <laughs> right? That's like the main theme with one or two friends maybe is here are all the ways that the world is going to hell. Let's talk about politics. Here's all the ways that my family is disagreeable and disruptive and not doing what they should. If they'd only listened to my advice, their lives would be happy, discuss. Or, you know, there's some friends where the, the trend is basically to just whine, <laughs> right? And it doesn't seem like whining, like your children whining. It seems like grown up sophisticated assessment of truth, but it's whining. Right. And so what is the difference then between that and kind of a centered objective assessment of there is disruption here that needs to be addressed, or there is an injustice here that I see, or there's something problematic happening. How can we problem solve? There's a very different mindset when speaking of faults from one perspective as opposed to the other. And we already know this, but the training here is to train in, if you're deciding whether or not to say something critical, just don't, <laughs> just don't, yeah? How often is it actually necessary? You know, and, and to look at the themes that run through the day, the themes in our inner narrative, the themes in our outer conversations, if we're just used to discussing problems as the main theme, it starts to feel like our life is actually full of a lot of problems. It can start to feel like life is actually quite difficult. And it really feels that way. And we don't realize how much we've contributed to that heaviness by zeroing in and emphasizing a specific portion of our life, forgetting the bigger picture. Now, when you're with your patients, I'm guessing you see this so easily. You're like, look, yeah, that's hard, but look at all these other amazing things you have going on with your patients, with your children, with your friends, I'm sure you can you know, immediately see how they're overemphasizing the negative and that there's a bigger picture. And if they'd open out into that, their life would feel a lot more spacious, a lot more abundant. And yet, you know, just sitting with what do we do with ourselves and what do we do, particularly when we're speaking to people, because speech has such a powerful aspect in communication. It, kind of makes us believe our thoughts more. You know, so we have thoughts running through our heads, some of them positive, some of them negative. 
some of them critical, some of them not. But as soon as we speak them, it's like we believe them more and they get more concreteness and more sense of truth to us. So this is kind of really saying, why are you saying what you're saying? You know, what's the deep motivation? Just because it's true, <laughs> you know, an objective truth or a subjective truth, whatever, even if it's a true statement, is it productive and necessary to express it? So, uh, you know, this is very challenging for us, I think, um, because then what are we going to talk about? <laughs> what are we going to talk about if we don't talk about problems? Um, how silly and American <laughs> do we sound if we only talk about the positive, you know? We start to sound really cheesy and um, you have an expression um, being like a Pollyanna, which is like seeing life through rose-colored glasses or seeing only the bright side of life at the expense of reality and you become unbearable to live with because you're just so sugary and sweet and it's unbearable, you know? And this is kind of the resistance, at least personally, that I feel in, you know, if I'm talking about the positive too much, it sounds like I don't understand the suffering of life. But I, I think that there's something really intriguing to sit with here of, what if we just consciously said less about the faults of others? What if we just consciously said less percentage-wise? What would that do internally? And what would that do externally? If we just consciously, we notice something that we feel critical about and just shut up. <laughs> um, and then, I think it starts to become clearer if your default, if your you know, kind of main agenda is to not be critical, then when something is really disruptive and something is really out of sync and you need to talk about it, I think that there's a lot more spaciousness to see it as um, something that we need creative solutions for, something that we can bring empathy and compassion to, something that's not personalized as happening to you or innate to them. It becomes a lot more spacious. And, um, and then the problem solving might not have that heaviness to it. Yeah, it's much more of a creative process of how do we help people understand each other or how do we help someone who's stuck, you know, navigate around that, etc. cetera. Um, so this can sound like a very simple, you know, don't talk bad about people like your grandma told you when you were five years old, but there's, there's deeper meanings to it, which is, you know, if you're focused in on the negative, you invite seeing the negative everywhere. And then samsara becomes more and more samsaric. You start to believe the story of your own hardship and reinforce it. And you start to believe the story of um, why, you know, people are the way they are. And then that becomes truer and truer for you. Um, so I'm curious how you respond to this verse and these ideas. Um, you know, it says, don't talk about the faults of another bodhisattva, but in all the commentaries I'm reading, it says, and remember, you don't know who a bodhisattva is. <laughs> and what's more, even if no one is a bodhisattva, they're all your kind mother sentient things. Give them a break. <laughs> it's so true. But, but I think sometimes in, uh, in therapy, um, I find it very challenging when uh, patients uh, complain and sometimes the complaints are very ju justified. They're always justified from their own uh, subjective point of view. When, uh, v when I validate that, then I can like, join a critical uh, stance, which I don't, I, I, I don't think is very useful. So it's very challenging sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. It's, I mean, I can imagine what it's like in your work. I just know what it's like with my friends, right? Um, to how to maintain kind of a, a neutral stance that is simultaneously completely accepting and embracing of them. You know, it's like it's kind of a neutral stance from your side, but from their side, you're just holding them and going, I know this is true for you in this context at this time, and you're suffering because of it you know, if I were you, I'd be feeling the same way. I've got you, I hold you, I love you. And I'm bringing the possibility that there's more to the story just by what I embody, not by what I say. 
Um, but you know what happens with people if they're on a roll with their complaints and they feel you not agreeing with them. Sometimes then they get even more on a roll and they have to prove it and they have to reinforce it. And you know what happens. I'm sure it happens every day. Um, so what's the correct empathic response that helps them lift out of getting into that circling, complaining, this is my whole life and my life will always be like this and the world's going to hell and why do I even bother and I'm going to dump it all on you because here you are in front of me and also I pay you, so bleh. <laughs> right, that probably happens sometimes. Um, just guessing. So, so what, what is the way to meet their criticism without agreeing with their criticism? you know, agreeing with something under their criticism so they feel resonance, even if the content you have doubt about. I'm sure this is the work that you're doing all the time, but I'm, I'm curious how you approach it both with others and also with yourself, how to kind of catch yourself when you know that you're falling into that trap yourself. Something that's not spiritual bypassing, you know, something that's not jumping over the problem, but is also not overemphasizing the problem and making it more real. Certainly remembering emptiness helps, but I'm curious what else helps. I think that um, in my experience, both in clinic and as a, as a person, um, being understood and being uh, empathically held uh, help to dissolve this uh, these feelings that sometimes seem so these thoughts that sometimes seem so concrete and uh, like i said before sometimes speaking make it makes it even more concrete but sometimes it really helps to dissolve because after you spoke about that you can see it from other points of view exactly. and you can you can really relax with that without bypassing them and without repressing them. At the same time, I completely understand and agree that sometimes speaking makes it even more, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's so interesting, isn't it? That it can go either way. Talking about it can dissolve it and release it and now it's not a big deal. Or talking can make it more real and more true and you become more certain. You know, it can really go either way. You know, and what, what do we bring to the encounter that helps lift it into the health? Yeah, and how do we do so without being weird? Yeah. Uh, uh, hear us. <laughs> I hear you in the back. Shall I speak? Yeah, I, go ahead. I, 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 I understand, I understand the, 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 the clinical uh, point of view of uh, to speak the speak out the problems, but I think that the, the, and uh, I don't see any way to, to avoid that. But I think that 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 carrying on talking of the problem will uh, reinforce the, the or revive the, the, the selflessness and mm. the self. The self and uh, and being back to the first square of the of the of the suffering. I mean, I mean, I I am seeing it in a theoretical way, but but as well in a, in a in a in a deep uh, emotional way because uh, being. Yeah, interesting. It's um, it's not simple. <laughs> yeah, in the moment it's not simple. Before the moment, it's quite simple and easy. But when you're actually in the moment, what do you do? Something about uh, understanding that everyone need to be understood. What Simona said, but uh, but understanding what? Not not the not the angry anger not the hatred not the critics not the content of the the um, words but understanding the what's like Fira said understanding the suffering the suffering of, of the, that causes all this um fault or and uh, 
So when you, 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 you are empathic or, or with compassion to the suffering underneath of every um, bad or uh, fault uh, words or expression, it's easier when, when you do it in the therapeutic, the therapeutic with the clinic because there is no other one. <laughs> you can dedicate yourself. No, no other that he harms right now. You don't need to 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 hold uh, the the others that he he may hurt or. You just need to be with this point. It's easier for me. And when you do it uh, with the compassion to the suffer, something uh, when you do it right, the person when he feel uh, understood, he comes, he, he he transforms sometimes. Yeah, and yeah, and it is easier if you have um, the focus of it's just you and me in this room at this time. I don't have to worry about you know yeah. <laughs> the other victims <laughs> or the other perpetrators. It's just you and me, and I can hold you and me, you know. Yeah, how do you hold just you? You know, that's that's kind of where it's starting from here is is how do you hold your own suffering? You know, which it's of harder. course it's yeah. harder to hold myself than to hold other. Amen. <laughs> right. Yeah. But it's it's fascinating because it's the same premise. It's that okay, if you're being critical and complaining and you know going on and on about politics, going on and on about relationships, going on and on about your inner struggle. Um, you know it's coming from suffering. Why aren't you just being nice to yourself? <laughs> you know, I think what, what we often do is we try to suppress the content or jump over the content or do something with the content rather than going under the content to, oh, you're having a bad day today. What's going on there, buddy? <laughs> you know, of course, they immediately go into a rural accent. <laughs> How you doing, buddy? Sound like my grandfather. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting to explore why is it that we give ourselves permission to be huge and vast and present if it's someone else's suffering. And then when it's only us, and we're only one, it's not even two people in the room, we kind of think it's not worth our time or we don't just stop and do that, that holding and that accepting to allow the rest to release. But it's important because if we don't, then we spread, you know, we become super spreaders, right? But not the virus, but of criticism. Yeah, I would like to say something psychoanalytically uh, from the point of view of the positive psychology and to remind us that uh, the processes of idealization are not, uh, are not equal to positive uh, psychology or to something which is uh, making uh, the bad good. It's something that uh, rely on a logical face and understanding of the process of, of transformation. The ability of being transformed or being transforming is what is the basis and foundation of the idealizing processes, which are making the, the positive way not something which is a negation or suppressing or repressing the, the phenomenological expressions of bad or, or harm. Of course, what is at the basis of things is, do we understand the human psychology as stand out of positive or negative sources? If we are making this uh, methodological and philosophical mistake that we are equalizing phenomenology with the explanation of things, then we are going to understand the bad and the harm as a basis. If we are understanding that phenomenology is not the explanation of the source, it has something which is connected to all kinds of contextual uh, conditions and the causes, then we can rely back on the goodness of the nature, of the possibility of the nature to be the tatagata nature, to, to touch the, the basic nature of the mind. So I think that this is something which is philosophical and methodological mistakes that is usually practiced in psychoanalysis 
and in other uh, spheres of the Western uh, uh, philosophies, to equal the, phenom the phenomenon with what is the nature of the mind. And this is a great mistake. It's not only an illusion or illusory understanding or thinking, but it's a real methodological mistake. What is there doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't make an evidence that this is the nature of things. It's what envelops things, but it's not the core of the thing. And as we have to uh, remove all kinds of contaminations and all kinds of uh, afflictive emotions and obscu obscurations, that's something which we can rely on. That phenomenon is not the explanation of the nature of things. And in this sense, uh, psychoanalytically, the term of idealization is not a defense. That's something we should remind uh, again and again. It's not something that cover my eyes, my psychic eyes from what is wrong. It's something that understand what is the core of things and not their uh, appearance of, of, uh, of the phenomenology. And in relying to the two perspectives or the two truths of uh, the Buddhist perspective, this is something that you can rely on it. I think uh, the, the thoughts about the, the, the Sagata heart is, uh, are very helpful uh, for me, but uh, I, I can't always remember them. So, uh, but in the, um, even if, even in the appearance sphere of things, Whenever I think of something bad, I try to think of something good as well. For example, if, if, if I'm with a patient and something about, about him uh, makes me withdraw or uh, worry or angry or whatever, I try to, to see the big picture. I try to see something else which has a different color or, or shape or, or I don't know, tone of, of color even. And uh, I think when we broaden the picture, even, if, even in the uh, conventional, in the appearance, in the, in the form, if you would like, uh, I think it, it, it's very helpful. And uh, I don't think I have to say something about it uh, immediately. But even if I, I tune my mind into a different channel, and it doesn't mean that I'm, I stop feeling the way I felt before or stop thinking that this person is annoying. Um, but it changes everything if I broaden the picture. Um, You're able to maintain equilibrium, you know, then being yeah. able and observing certain things doesn't disturb your peace. Yeah, and I know that in a minute I will feel differently. And in two days from now, I certainly will feel differently. So. Yeah, the, it's, it's skillful. I mean, it's a little bit like there's a, um, it's referring to Buddhism, but it's a bit secularized. It's called training and open focus. And you do it for um, anxiety or you do it for physical pain. And um, if you're feeling, for example, claustrophobic and like you don't have any space, you know, imagine you're trapped in an Indian train station or something and there's just people everywhere and you're feeling claustrophobic, that you um, take your mind and you stretch it to all of the areas where there are space. So you stretch your mind upward to the ceiling and all of the space above you and all of the space in between this and that and even the space between your skin and your clothes and you, you, you know, stretch the mind to remember the space that is there and then you don't feel so claustrophobic. Or your body is hurting in one particular area and it's really pulling your focus. You consciously pull your focus to the areas of the body that are doing fine and are quite settled. And it again, you know, releases the tension while at the same time not negating the fact of the suffering area. It just puts it in a, a focus that doesn't make it overwhelming. So, so it's, it reminds me of that a little bit, how you're describing it. And, and I think it's very useful. And then when you're with people, how do you just keep your mouth shut while being very, very present and very, very accepting 
and not judging them for being critical because you know just as easily you're that one in the wrong in the wrong day in the wrong state of mind um that training in what not to say is really an interesting place of practice what not to say yeah it relates to um the next verse so we'll do the next verse um over the page on verse 33 which is um <laughs> respect uh, reward and respect cause us to quarrel or argue and make hearing, thinking, and meditation decline. For this reason, give up attachments to households of friends, relatives, and benefactors. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. And so it's, it's talking a little bit about when things are difficult, it disturbs the mind. And in this case, when things are good, it can disturb the mind if either aversion or attachment is present. So this is talking about if you're getting, um, you know, validated and you're getting respect and you're getting authority and you're getting what your ego wants to get, um, it actually agitates the mind and makes it harder to meditate. In the same way as the previous verse, when you have a lot of harsh speech and you're seeing things as negative, then when you go to sit on your cushion, the mind is much more likely to be agitated and, um, you know, might not even be obsessed with the content of your criticism. It's just generally stirred up, you know? So we're generally stirred up by aversion or we're generally stirred up by attachment. And that has an influence on our cushion. And then our cushion has an influence on off the cushion and it has this interdependence. And here we're looking at, um, if we're kind of craving and hunting for re reward and respect. Of course, we deserve respect, but that doesn't mean we should um, expect it or feel entitled to it or demand it or be shocked when people don't give it to us. But of course, all people deserve respect. But the idea that we deserve and should expect needs to be broken, right? Because people are self-absorbed. Why would they think of others? <laughs> it's remarkable that they're ever nice, right? Um, so it's that level and then going down it's saying give up attachment to the households of friends relations and benefactors this has a relationship to a little bit who do we think we are if certain people are our friends you know if you have like rich fan friends or if you have famous friends or if you have you know people that are in good standing in your particular community and they're your friend the way in which maintaining that and being seen to have that, it continues the agitation and stirring up of your mind. Um, so, you know, it talks about benefactors as well. And in the commentaries, it talks a lot about how we can be attached to what we've been given and then start to feel like we're entitled to it, we deserve it in and of itself forgetting that it was, you know, a gift and all gifts usually have conditions and time limitations and people's egos involved. But as soon as we're given something, at first we feel grateful and at second we feel we deserve it and we're entitled to it. There's kind of a, a sequence that happens, you know, like someone brings you a gift to your house, you go, oh, thank you, this is so lovely. And then the next second is, this is mine, I deserve it. I'm keeping it forever, you know, and it, it kind of locks in. And um, we have a lot of discussions about this at Dharma centers because benefactors are the source of the security of the center. And benefactors are by nature unreliable because people are unreliable. So of course a benefactor in like a great moment of inspiration and feeling connected to the Dharma and connected to the community will say, I'm going to fund your whole study program and I'm going to make sure all the nuns have working toilets, you know, and you're like, oh, I'm so grateful. Thank you so much benefactor for looking after us. And then um, the plans start and the structures start and the logistics start and things don't go as planned. Surprise, <laughs> you know, as if they ever do. And, um, and then you start to feel um, disappointed and entitled, forgetting that it was a gift. You know, like, you said you were going to fix all of our toilets and you hadn't fixed them. You know, and you can feel like this self-righteous indignation, forgetting the gratitude you felt at the beginning and just the idea that someone cared enough to notice was a big deal, let alone doing something about it. So, so we do this with all of the, quote, gifts of our life 
the friend gifts, the possession gifts, the benefactor gifts, is that at first we're grateful and we're so touched. And then the next moment we lock down and feel we deserve it and it's ours and it becomes identification. So how do we live in that place of just, just gratitude? Just spacious gratitude without expectations. You know, that's really what's being touched in on here. So living in this place of gratitude doesn't mean that you're lower. It means that you're expansive and just, just appreciative, you know, that anyone ever takes a moment to connect because the ego traps are so hardwired. It's, it's really remarkable when people are kind. And if they forget to be kind and their inspiration wears off and they're inconsistent and unreliable, that's to be expected. We're not reliable. <laughs> you know, why do we expect other people to be? So, uh, so this one has a lot of layers as well. Um, and it's interesting. And to be attached to their households, you know, it, it can be, there's a lot of different angles to look at it, but with both of these verses, 32 and 33, um, we're looking at the way that having, um, having something arise within the mind and then attaching to it is the problem. So the arising you know, of critical thoughts or the arising of attached thoughts isn't nearly as big a deal as believing them. Yeah, they'll arise because of habit. You'll have critical thoughts. You'll have attached thoughts, right? You'll feel annoyed. You'll feel entitled. That's completely normal. But it, the training here is to say it arises. That doesn't mean it's true. I feel it. It's just from habit. It's just habit. It doesn't mean it's true. It, it was true in one context, in one situation. How no, who knows how long ago? And now I'm taking that moment and bleeding it into my whole life and assuming that that's a pervasive truth. And now I'm trapped by that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so you know, both of these verses are ways to release yourself from the everyday suffering we give ourselves. You know, just the immediate everyday. Make sense? Yeah, easy, okay, Heart Sutra. Page 57. So because we're talking about, um, you know, habits of mind and then believing the habits of mind, um, I thought to zero in on the 12 link section of the Heart Sutra today, and we'll continue with it next week. So if, as it gets more and more familiar, if you start to have like, what does this bit mean? What does that bit mean? Make sure you write it down in the margins or whatever so that we can talk about it as time goes by. But, um, but today we'll zero in a little bit on the 12 link section. Um... What, what, what do you think about recognition, um, to, to recognize? I mean, we, we tend to think that if we don't recognize okay. whatever is uh, so uh, uh, annoying to us, then, then it will not dissolve. I mean, there's a difference between recognizing and believing. You know, uh, so I think that definitely recognizing is important, but you can recognize any number of things. And if you have space to say, and that might not actually be true at all. There's a little inner like cringe that can happen with you and your, you know, your ego or your self grasping where you say, I don't want to not believe this. I'm used to believing this, but if you can hold it with some objectivity, acknowledge that you feel that way while at the same time, acknowledging that there's always been more to the story so it can release back out. You know, it's, it's like if you, you know, woke up suddenly in the middle of the night from a nightmare. Um, it's not like you're pretending to not be afraid, but you're just taking a minute and saying, yeah, okay, I'm safe in my house. There are no monsters chasing me. Okay, it feels real and I can be kind to myself, but it doesn't mean that there's any aspect of truth just because my feelings are vivid, you know? And, uh, you know, I can go through layers of why the nightmare happened to begin with, and I can do some, I don't know, Jungian dream analysis and whatever, and that's all very cool. But, you know, the point is to have enough space to say I can acknowledge what's arising without believing what's arising. I'd, I'd like to share an image that, Baba, to my mind, I, I, I feel that, that the mind is like, is like the, 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 the ground or the earth of the Dead Sea. 
So you put a lot of water there and it becomes directly salty. So, so, it's, it's, so, so it's very, very difficult to get this earth, to, to get this soil to become sweet. It's true. It's true. It's, it's nicer to frame it as the Dead Sea than to frame it as, I don't know, the Red Sea. <laughs> you know, at least the Dead Sea is clear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, but that's the thing is that the salt has never permeated the fundamental essence of the water, even though it seems as if they're the same. So this, this is the difficulty, and I, I think that you guys know far better than I do about how important it is for people's suffering to be seen and held and acknowledged, and that if you do that in the, quote, wrong way, that becomes one more point of identification, and then, you know, people live there as that victim or as that whatever forever, and it becomes its own problem. But the initial step is so important to say, yes, I see you. I see that this happened. I see this is why. I get it, you know, like even if you're not saying it in those words, just the complete holding and acceptance of the whole picture so that the picture can expand, so that the whole concept of picturing can release, you know, that those stages have to happen. But if you get locked into one, it becomes its own problem, even if initially it was a symptom of moving towards health. I don't know if you agree with that or not, um, just practically speaking or internally for yourself. So, you know, how do we break patterns, especially patterns and uh, repetitive behaviors that are so familiar to us that we don't have to stop and think, they just arise like naturally because they're so familiar. How do we interrupt cycles? And um, interrupting cycles is the, basically the whole work of the discussion on the 12 links of dependent arising. And we, we talked about it a few years ago, um, but I think to frame it specifically in terms of cutting momentum when it when the story starts to believe itself you know to to really bring in more i think this is really key so um so i'll read up until the 12 link section and then we'll talk about that so starting on page 57 thus did i hear one the bhagawan was dwelling on mass of vultures mountain in rajagriya together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas at that time, the Bhagawan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Shariputra, Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form, form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness. No eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. No visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch and no phenomena. There is no eye element and so on, up to and including no mind element and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance and no extinction of ignorance, so on, up to and including no aging and death and no extinction of aging and death. Okay, so there's the 12 links section. And 
so let's, let's just start by breaking down um, the list into the categories that show the points where change is possible and the points where change is much harder. So if we start sort of at the beginning, you have the projecting factors, you know, that which projects experience. So you have ignorance, right? Starting at the beginning, ignorance. You have karmic formations and you have consciousness, right? Do you remember there's the, the blind person <laughs> and then there's the uh, person making pots and then there's um, the monkey. Yeah, so you have those three and they go together. They're kind of in a section. So basically, if you have ignorance, and we do, you will necessarily have negative karma created, which will necessarily leave a negative seed on your primary consciousness, but that's not yet ripened into experience. Okay, so, so these three, I think, are really important to understand because the consciousness link, number three, is really got two sections, right? There's the consciousness at the time that the seed is planted, and there's the consciousness at the time that experience is arising. So it's, it's as if it's two links, consciousness. But what we're talking about here is this sequence of three is what projects what happens next, which is name and form, which you know are the five aggregates, right? People in the ship, um, the six sources, right? I primary, I sense power, no sense power, ear sense power, those guys. Um, and then contact, roughly speaking, outside and inside coming together, and then feeling. So that section is what's projected, right? Projected. And those, that section of basically once you're embodied, <laughs> then you have certain trends and it leads to feeling, which remember the picture of the 12 links, feeling was like the arrow in the eye basically saying when you feel something, good, bad, whatever, it's as significant as though you had an arrow in your eye. You cannot ignore feeling. And so, you know, people misunderstand Buddhism all the time and think that we're negating feelings or we're minimizing feelings. And, you know, there's a lot of um, misunderstandings about that when right there in the very wheel of life is saying, no, feeling is quite significant. Could you ignore having an arrow in your eye? No, you can't ignore feelings either. But feelings don't equate to responses, they're just used to it. You know, so this is your fundamental point of work, is you can feel something without believing the content of your habits. You can feel a, a, a rush of unpleasantness, of suffering, of grief, physically or mentally. And if you remember in the back of your mind that this was all coming from projecting situations leading up to this point, it's not actually a result of this moment. Yeah. So this moment is not about this moment. <laughs> your, your feelings, your emotions, your mental grief, your mental happiness, this is all related to the past. So don't believe what your mind is telling you about why it's normal for you to feel this way, because usually the story we tell us is, I feel this way because of what's happening now. And you don't feel this way because of what's happening now. You feel this way because of what happened in the past. And what's happening now is the condition. So this is the fundamental point of work because if you can prevent feeling from turning into craving, grasping, becoming, then you're really interrupting the whole problem. Is this ringing bells, right? We spent a lot of time with this, but we haven't talked about it in a while. So if you can prevent feeling from turning into craving, right? Craving for more of what gives you pleasure or craving to be separated from what seems to give you suffering. If you can be, live in that place of just because I feel it doesn't mean it's about this moment. It doesn't mean my story is true. It takes tremendous will to sit in the middle of your storm and not believe all of the weather. Yeah, you can say it's a natural response from the past. It's a, if you like, valid response from the past. It's a response that, you know, can have compassion and acceptance and friendliness about it. And none of that means that it's true in the sense of my experience is telling me something about what's happening now. And yet it is sort of because the conditions of now are bringing it out. 
But again and again, it's this conversation of what is the difference between a substantial cause and a coactive condition. And we usually take conditions to be causes. And they're just conditions. If there was no seed, there'd be no experience. Yeah. So this, this point I'm hoping is clear by now, but if it's not clear, that's completely fine and ask. But the main issue in life is that we're <laughs> giving conditions the credit for being the cause and they're not. Yeah. So, okay, so you got your craving and um, then we don't examine our craving or confront our craving. We just believe that if I want it, it is true and right. Or if I want to be separated from it, it is true and right. And so it builds momentum and turns into grasping. So if you're very well trained, you can be in craving and try to break the spell. But it's much easier if you can catch it back when it's feeling. Yeah, so if, you know, if you're actually really, oh, I have to get away from this person. Oh, I must have this person next to me. Oh, I have to get away from this food. Oh, I must have more of this food, whatever, you know. If you can feel that arising within you, that tug, that push or that pull, and not believe that, then you're also interrupting the momentum. Yeah. So these craving and grasping and then existence or potential existence, these are like the actualizers. Yeah, the actualizers, which will lead to what is actualized, your next birth. Yeah, so they're kind of what takes the seeds and waters them, you know, and if you don't water them, they won't ripen. So this is a really essential piece of practice. And basically, because of grasping, your old karma gets nourished into your new birth. Right, so potential existence or becoming that link number 10, that is also karma. And it's basically, you know, you water it enough, it's going to sprout. And now your next life is more of the same, whether it's the next life, meaning just tomorrow, or it's the next life, literally it's life. There's different ways to look at these, but these actualizers lead to what is actualized, birth, aging, and death. So these points of transition are what we're trying to understand, which, you know, the simple version is suffering leads to negative karma, but it doesn't have to, right? <laughs> karma leads to negative states of mind and behaviors, but it doesn't have to. Negative states of mind and behaviors lead to more suffering, but they don't have to. So there's, you know, a potential junction um, to break those associations at any point. It's just about catching it and then not beating yourself up if you miss your window because there'll be another window. Does it make sense? So is that, is that ringing bells or did you get lost at any point? So then when you're looking at the emptiness of it and you're looking how there is no ignorance and there is no extinction of ignorance and so on up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death, you're just bringing in, instead of looking at the dependent origination of things and how these causes and conditions lead to these effects, you're looking at how none of those causes and conditions lead to those effects in and of themselves. All of them are related and have context. All of them are related to a valid basis, merely labeled by the mind, and then you open out into, which means they are all empty. So you start with the course level of dependency causes and conditions and drop down into looking at parts and context and drop down into looking at the basis of designation and mind's imputation and then release into a sense of expansive, none of it from its own side. 
Does that, does that make sense? So normally we look at it, at it from the perspective of the relative, but just to, you know, work your way into from the ultimate. I, I have uh, one question and one, one uh, comment. I think that you, you're seeing one important thing and it's very, I, ca I can personally, uh, my mind hasn't developed to follow what you're saying. So I think it's very important. So I, I need much more clarification. That's one thing. The second thing that when we got in contact <clears throat> before going to grasping, I mean, when we start feeling uh, suffering uh, mentally or physically, so sh shall we shall we we think of it as how how can we deal with it? How can I mean? You said that you 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 shouldn't be craving to situation where you. Because the craving, this situation could be that I, I may feel better, physically or mentally, I may be cured. So does that, is it craving, being or thinking or feeling this way? I think I think only you know in the moment. You know, if the mind is very agitated, then probably there is a negative state of mind there. Well, definitely there's a negative state of mind there. If it's coming from a position of peace just kind of raw wanting, raw desire that is unafflicted, there is a possibility of such a thing. You just have to ask, is the mind rattled? Is the mind jarred? Is it, you know, going back and forth between things or is there a steadiness and a clarity? Which doesn't necessarily mean that you're accurate about what you need to do, but you're less afflicted for sure. But um, we'll go back over it in our karma retreat too, because, um, but more in meditation, less in words, more just like let's, let's experientially kind of go through breaking the links, um, because of course the 12 links in karma is a, a related topic. So we'll go back over it in the retreat too. Yeah, okay, so we have to finish, um, right? Yes, okay. Um, and so just take a minute and dedicate. And I thought that we would start um, dedicating using the um, Heart Sutra Mantra. Tayata gate gate aragate arasam gate bodhisattva. Okay, see you next week. Thanks, guys.